Hi, everybody. My name is David Hood, and I help give leadership to Southeast City Church, and we are so grateful to have you here with us today, church family. Love you guys. Miss you guys. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, face-to-face soon. Hope that you're holding up well and looking forward to phase one. Uh, If you are a visitor or a guest with us here today, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you stick with us through the whole thing. Uh, I hope that you reach out and connect with us through our site afterwards. More than anything, uh, for everybody, I hope that you are blessed today. Uh, I am very grateful uh, that we serve a God who is a loving Heavenly Father and who knows exactly what our needs are. Uh, We are all carrying different burdens and weights right now. We are all uh, coping in different ways with what's going on. We're all doing differently psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. And God knows exactly where each and every one of us is at. And he is able to meet us where we're at and minister to us and give us what we need. And so I really pray that that is what happens today. That we would all have an encounter with God and we would get what we need from our loving Heavenly Father today. So thanks again for being with us. I'm going to turn it over now to Diana and Kirsten. And they're going to lead us in musical worship. Thank you so much, Diana and Kirsten, for leading us in worship today. Uh, Our scripture reading for today comes out of Hebrew chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, all 28 verses, so stick with me. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, remains a priest forever. Now consider how this this great man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their brothers, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected tenths from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die receive tenths, but in the other case, scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives tents, has paid tents through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on a legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable, for the law perfected nothing, but a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. None of this happened without an oath, for others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office, but because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray for your abundant help today as we go through this dense and difficult to understand passage, a passage that in many ways we might read it and go, what in the world does this have to do with my life? Why should I care about this Melchizedek? God, everything written in your word is good for us. It's profitable for us in in some way. There is much for us to learn here. So God, help us as we go through these verses today. Speak to us, encounter us. May we not leave from this time together unchanged. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. At the moment, uh, the preacher to the Hebrews is arguing that Jesus is a greater high priest and that Jesus has a greater priesthood. He started this argument in chapter 5 and then we had that bit of an excursus last week and now he's picking it up again in the latter part of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7. Now I only read chapter 7 but we will reference back to the latter part of chapter 6. The main argument that the preacher makes in this chapter is that Jesus is a greater high priest than Aaron. His is a greater priesthood than the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood because he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, who in the world is Melchizedek? Who is this guy? Uh, If you jump back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14, there's a few verses, just a few verses, dedicated to this little known and yet extremely important character in the Old Testament in redemptive history. In Genesis chapter 14, just to give you a little bit of context, there are several kings that are at war with each other. They're not kings in the traditional sense, the way we think of kings. They're not kings of nations or empires, but more they're kings of cities cities of a few thousand people, and so they're more like glorified mayors, and their armies are more like glorified raiding bands, and uh, Ketaliomer gets four other kings, or sorry, three other kings together with him, and they go out and they attack the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were bored one Saturday, and so they got together, and they attacked the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they plundered them, and they take off with all of the stuff that they've plundered from Sodom and Gomorrah. In the process, they end up kidnapping Abraham's nephew Lot and his wife and his children, And Abraham, who at this point is known as Abram, hears about this, and he goes after Keterleomer and all of the other kings in the armies. He goes after them with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he overtakes them, and he defeats them, and he gets everything back. And in verse 17 of Genesis 14, we read this, after Abram returned from defeating the kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And then we jump down to verse 21. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to Yahweh, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of the men who came with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, they can take their share. Now, that to me would seem like a complete story in and of itself, this interaction between Abram and the king of Sodom. But inserted right into the middle of this story, I started in verse 17 and then I jumped down to verse 21. Verses 18 to 20 are just inserted into the middle of this story, and this is what those verses say. So the king of Sodom comes out to meet Abram, and then it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and I give praise to God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. This is kind of a seemingly random story that we might rush through uh, without giving it much thought, but the preacher to the Hebrews under the inspiration of the Spirit, sees a whole lot more going on in this story than you and I might initially see. The preacher sees several important details about this Melchizedek. Number one, Melchizedek's name literally means king of righteousness. And he is the king of a city known as Salem or Shalom. 
which when we say shalom, we, we translate it peace from the Hebrew. Uh, for us, it, it, it just really means the absence of war and conflict. But in the Hebrew mentality, peace is much deeper than that. It's absolute tranquility and harmony. Harmony between you and God, harmony within yourself, harmony between you and other people, harmony between you and the creation. So Melchizedek is the king of shalom. And there were actually many Salems in the ancient Near East, and given the geography of where all this is happening, it's entirely possible that Melchizedek is the king of Jerusalem, the city that would eventually become God's city, the capital of Israel, the home of the temple, the center of the promised land where God was starting to recreate his broken world. In the last book of the Bible, so we've started with Genesis, in the very last book of the Bible, in Revelation, John, an early follower of Jesus, he's given a, a, a vision of the future and of God's total victory over all evil, and he sees heaven come down and essentially marry creation. And this, this union between heaven and earth Um, restores and renews creation, creates this, this new creation. And John is told that this new creation, another name for it is the new Jerusalem. And I love the way the Bible Project puts it. The new Jerusalem is going to be a great city where human cultures and all of their diversity work together in peace and harmony before God. And John gives that revelation in Revelation 21, that vision of the new Jerusalem. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness, according to his name. He's the king of Jerusalem, city of peace. And he's also a priest. And not a pagan priest. There were lots of those, but it says he was a priest of God most high. So this seemingly random, seemingly out of nowhere priest believes in and serves Yahweh. He believes in and serves Abraham's God, separate from Abraham, apart from Abraham. He's never met Abraham before, and yet he serves and worships Abraham's God, the God, the creator of heaven and earth. This is, this is incredibly interesting. And this priest blesses Abraham, which the the preacher sees based on the customs of the day as a demonstration of Melchizedek's superiority to Abram, right? The, The greater blesses the lesser. You're not blessed by your children. You're not blessed by your slaves. You're not blessed by your subjects or your peers in the ancient Near East. If you have authority over others, you bless them, and you are blessed by those who have authority over you. And so Melchizedek blesses Abraham. He seems to assume he has authority over Abraham. He's superior to Abram. And Abram seems to recognize the superiority of Melchizedek because he gives him a tenth of all of the spoils. It's interesting. He gives absolutely nothing to the king of Sodom and wants nothing from the king of Sodom. He has no regard for the king of Sodom. But this Melchizedek... He seems to see in him a kindred spirit and someone who he should revere and honor. The preacher in Hebrews 7 points out that the Levitical priests were owed a tenth of everything by the law of Moses because of their service to God, right? They served full time. They served vocationally as priests and therefore they were supported materially by the people of God at God's command. But Abraham willingly gave to Melchizedek a priest who preceded Moses and the law, whose lineage wasn't tied to Aaron at all. And then the preacher notices this. He says, unlike almost every other significant historical figure in Genesis up until this point, Melchizedek's genealogy isn't mentioned. Does that mean that he doesn't have one? No, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have one, but it's curiously left out of the account. Uh, New Testament Theologian, scholar Don Carson says, arguments from silence are often weak, but silence is significant when you expect to hear noise. Up until this point, every significant figure were told who their parents are, were told how long they lived, were told who their children were, were told when they died, but none of these details are given for Melchizedek. He seemingly has no mother, 
No father, no beginning, and no end. It's as if he just appears and then disappears. And the preacher finds all of this very interesting. And he says in Hebrews chapter 7, Melchizedek is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. No beginning, no end, superior even to Abraham, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, Jerusalem. Some have surmised that Melchizedek is actually Jesus. Uh, That in Melchizedek we have an encounter with a pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. Now what do I mean by pre-incarnate? In the Old Testament we see the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. We see him appear to people not as an actual human being, the Son of God in human flesh, miraculously conceived in the Virgin Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit, two natures permanently united in person, but merely appearing as a human or angel. So prior to Jesus' incarnation, prior to the permanent union of human and divine in Jesus, the Son of God appeared in human form or as an angel, the angel of the Lord to people in the Old Testament. And some people believe that that is who Melchizedek is. Melchizedek is one of these pre-incarnate encounters between the Son of God and an individual in the Old Testament. However, there's Nothing in the text to suggest that Abraham is having some kind of divine encounter. If if you want an example of a pre-incarnate interaction, uh, one that comes to mind is from the book of Joshua. Joshua, on the eve of Israel's conquest of Jericho, we read this. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in worship and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua is encountering the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Son of God in human form. But he, he recognizes that this man is no mere man. This is a divine encounter. He falls down and he worships. He's told that the ground he's on is holy. Nothing like that happens in Genesis 14. To some degree, I think people believe that Melchizedek is Jesus because it's hard for anybody to wrap their mind around their being this priest of Yahweh, this priest of God Most High in somewhere as wicked as Canaan, right? Our assumption is that Abraham is the only person on the face of the earth who knows Yahweh. He's alone in knowing Yahweh. That's often our assumption, and yet there's actually nothing in the scriptures to suggest that this is true. Yes, God chooses Abraham and his descendants to be his chosen people, the nation through whom the Messiah would come, but this does not mean that only the Jews knew and followed Yahweh. God has his people everywhere, even in wicked Canaan. And so I believe that Melchizedek is a normal person. He's nothing divine, And I believe that God orchestrated this encounter between Abraham and Melchizedek and then guided the writer of Genesis to record this encounter in the way that it was recorded, recording certain details while leaving others out. God had something that he wanted to say to Israel and to the world through this encounter and through the way this encounter was recorded. He wanted to say something about his Messiah, And about his restorative work in the world, he wanted to say something about Jesus. Jesus is going to be a priest like Melchizedek. Jump ahead from Genesis chapter 14. Years after this, David is writing. And David understood that this passage was messianic. It was about the Messiah. It was about Jesus, even though he didn't know Jesus by name. 
He may very well have been meditating on Genesis chapter 14, and the Holy Spirit revealed to him what this text was all about. And David writes this in Psalm 110. It's a short little psalm. He says, This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on your day of battle. In holy splendor from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. Forever you are a priest like Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his anger. He will judge the nations, heaping up corpses. He will crush leaders over the entire world. He will drink from the brook by the road, and therefore he will lift up his head. Now, there's a lot here, but we'll look at it fairly quickly. David starts this psalm with, this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. In other words, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord. There's two lords here. David has two lords. Now, David is the king. He is the one with the most authority in the land. So who is this Lord other than Yahweh that David is referring to? He's talking about the Messiah in this song. And so David seems to understand that the Messiah who is to come is a divine figure. The Messiah is someone who is his Lord, just as Yahweh is his Lord. Now, I don't know if David understood the complexities of the Trinity. There's one God who eternally exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I I imagine he did not understand all of that, but he at least understood from this psalm that the the Messiah had deity. Somehow, Even though there is one God, the Messiah would also be God and Lord. And Jesus actually uses this psalm in arguing for his deity in the New Testament. David also saw that the Messiah would be human as well. He says he will drink from the brook by the road. He'll be divine. He'll have deity, but he'll get thirsty. And he'll drink from the brook by the road. Again, I don't know if David understood the complexities of the incarnation, right? Human and divine in one person, Jesus as fully God and fully human. I doubt he understood all of the complexities of that, but it was revealed to him by God that somehow the Messiah would be both divine and human. The Messiah would be a God-man. And then David goes on to freely admit that the Messiah will be a greater king than he's ever been. Any king before him, any king after him. This this king will vanquish all evil. He won't just vanquish all of Israel's political enemies. He will rule the whole world, the whole universe. He won't just rule a strip of land in the Middle East. And he'll be a priest like Melchizedek forever. He won't just be a king, he'll be a priest as well, a priest like Melchizedek, a priest with no beginning, no end, superior even to Abraham, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, Jerusalem. And when you look at Jesus, that is who Jesus is. Jesus has no beginning and no end in the truest sense. He is the eternal, everlasting God. He has no start, he will have No end. He has always been. He has eternally self-existed. He is superior to Abraham. Right? When the religious leaders of Jesus' day were saying, we have Abraham as our father, Jesus' response to them was what? Before Abraham was, I am. He's the king of actual righteousness. So he doesn't just have a name that means king of righteousness. He is literally the embodiment of of righteousness. Everything he did was perfectly in conformity to the will of God. He was absolutely in perfect right relationship with God and perfect right relationship with his neighbor and himself and the creation. He is righteous and the king of righteousness. And he is the king of actual peace. 
He's the king of that new Jerusalem that John sees in Revelation, that new creation when all evil is vanquished and expelled and everything sad comes untrue and everything is set to rights and the world is as it should be and there is at every level deep, deep shalom and harmony. Jesus is the king of that kingdom, the king of that new creation, that new Jerusalem. So Jesus is indeed a priest like Melchizedek. But there's something else here. And we might miss it as New Testament, New Covenant church people. Under the Old Covenant in Israel, it was actually forbidden for a king to be a priest and for a priest to be a king. They were different offices and they were meant to be kept entirely distinct with no Overlap. We have accounts of a few kings like Saul and Uzziah attempting to breach that divide and assume priestly duties for themselves, and it does not go well. They get punished. They get penalized for it. And yet Melchizedek is a king priest. He held both offices. Now, this was before Moses. This was before the law. This was before Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, the Old Covenant, It was before all of that. David was under all of that. So David was a king, but he was not a priest. And he would never be a priest. And no king like him would ever be a priest. No king under the old covenant would ever be a priest. And yet David prophesies here in Psalm 110 that the Messiah is going to be a king priest just as Melchizedek was. He'll hold both offices And he'll hold them for forever. Now he cannot do this if he's a priest under the old covenant. If he's a priest after the order of Aaron. So his priesthood must be of a different order. The order of Melchizedek. So now we jump back to Hebrews. The preacher sees this thread starting in Genesis chapter 14. Picked up in Psalm 10. And he sees this thread culminate in Jesus. He sees Jesus as the fulfillment of this thread, starting with Melchizedek. And he says this in verse 11. If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on a legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. For the law perfected nothing, but a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So under the old covenant, as we've said before, the priests came through Aaron's line. They came through the tribe of Levi. You couldn't be a priest if you weren't of Aaron. And yet Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. He can't be a priest under the old system, but he can if his priesthood isn't after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. Under the old covenant, a priest couldn't be a king, but Jesus is both a king and a priest. A legal covenantal impossibility in the Old Testament unless Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek and not of Aaron. The preacher here is saying that God's Messiah being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek allows Jesus to be that Messiah. But he also points out that Jesus' priesthood being in the order of Melchizedek and its being eternal is a statement It's a statement made by God. If Aaron's priesthood was enough, if the priesthood of the old covenant, if the priesthood under Moses' law, if the priesthood of the Old Testament was enough, there would have been no need for a priest from another order. 
There would have been no need for a priest from somewhere else. If the old system, if the way things were done under Moses was enough, then Jesus would have come through that system and he would have adhered to that system. And yet Jesus is a priest without the right lineage. He's not in the Aaronic succession. He has no physical descent from Aaron. Jesus' priesthood is a statement that these things are not enough. The Mosaic Covenant, the law, the Levitical priesthood, they are not enough. And now that Jesus has come, a priest from a different order forever, all of those things have now been declared obsolete. They've passed away. And Jesus has replaced them with a new and better priesthood, a new and better law, and a new and better covenant, which is what chapter 8 is about, which is what Taffy will look at next week. And the eternality of Jesus' priesthood is a declaration that his priesthood is final and enough. There will not be another priest after Jesus. Everything before Jesus culminates in, find its fulfillment in Jesus. So everything now from the old is obsolete unless Jesus brings it into the new. And the question we might have is, but how? How could Jesus do this? The preacher says, Jesus did not become a priest based on a legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. A couple of weeks ago when I talked about Jesus' greater priesthood, I said that what a high priest was meant to do is he was meant to reflect God Represent God to the people and represent the people to God. Well, the priests of the Old Testament weren't able to do that very well. Because they were fallen, weak, sinful human beings, they could not really represent God to the people. And because priests were sinners like the people, they couldn't really represent the people to God. They couldn't deal decisively or effectively with the sin of the people. They couldn't deal decisively or effectively with the sin problem that humanity had. And so Jesus was sent to be our high priest. And as the sinless God-man, he has accomplished everything that the high priest was meant to do perfectly. Jesus, because he's God, is able to perfectly represent God to us. When we look at Jesus, we see the Father, we see God. Jesus, as one of us, is able to perfectly represent humanity to the Father. And as the sinless God-man, he is able to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. He is able to sacrifice sacrifice himself that we might be forgiven and rescued. Jesus is able to make us right with God and deal decisively and effectively with our sin, with the penalty of sin, with the power of sin, with the presence of sin. He's accomplished everything that the high priest was meant to do perfectly. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead, his indestructible life, is a declaration to the world that Jesus' sacrifice is acceptable, that he is all of those things that I just said he is. God raised him up from the dead, and God has made him the king over his kingdom. Jesus rules as king, and he's bringing in the kingdom of God, and someday he will fully and completely bring Bring in the kingdom of God. And so because of all of this, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus came from the wrong tribe. God has declared him to be high priest. He can't be a priest and a king. God has declared him to be high priest. A king priest in the order of Melchizedek. It is enough that God has declared it, but God has even sworn an oath. Now, no other priest needed to be sworn in by an oath. There was a very clear succession from Aaron. It was all about lineage, but Jesus was sworn in by an oath, an oath made by God. And God swore that oath by himself. And this is what the latter part of chapter 6 is about. 
The preacher says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. For men swear by something greater than themselves, and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. Right? We, we tend, as human beings, to swear by things that have significance to us. Right? I swear on my mother's grave. Right? We, sw- we swear by things that have great significance for us. And when we swear an oath, that's supposed to put an end to all disputes. Oh, he swore on something. He will come through. He will keep his word. Oaths matter to us. God, having nothing and nobody greater to swear by than himself, swears by himself, and he will not change his mind. Jesus is his king priest for his people, for his children, for his church. And his priesthood is eternal. And by its very nature and existence, it supersedes and renders obsolete Moses and Aaron and everything that came before it. Now, the question you might have at this point, and it's the question we'll finish on, so what? (laughs) This is all interesting, but so what? What do you want me to do with this, David? Well, the number one thing I want you to do is marvel at how amazing the Bible is. The whole Bible fits together. Even the seemingly random stories of the Old Testament have significance that carries through the whole Bible and culminates in Jesus. The Bible was written by more than 40 authors over more than 1,500 years in three different languages, and yet the Bible is a unified story. I mean, if that isn't a testimony to this being more than just a human book and God's word as well, I don't know what else could be a testimony to that. There are dozens of threads throughout the Old Testament that find their fulfillment, their culmination, their climax in Jesus. You can follow a whole bunch of them through king and kingdom Eden, Adam, covenant, Abraham's seed, prophet, tabernacle, temple, blood sacrifice, atonement, the priesthood, the law, the land, Israel, Jerusalem, clean and unclean, exile, the exodus, Passover, the wilderness, the promised land, Sabbath. There are so many threads. You follow them through the Bible and they find their culmination, their climax in Jesus. The Bible is a unified story that is all about Jesus. We should marvel at that. But another thing that I want us to take away from this passage is that Jesus is a king priest. Jesus is not just our king. If he was just our king, that would be kind of terrifying, right? Kings have a lot of power and a lot of authority and they get to command and and boss us around. But Jesus isn't just a king. He's also our sympathetic high priest. We have a priest for a king. Jesus doesn't just have authority over us, but he loves us. He gets what it's like to be us. He's endured everything that we could ever possibly have to endure. He has sacrificed himself for us. He gave his life for our forgiveness and our redemption. We have a king who deeply loves us, who loves us sacrificially and selflessly. There's been no other king in history like that. Most kings are entirely Um, separated from their subjects and have no idea what their subjects go through on a daily basis and they don't really necessarily care about their subjects. That's not the kind of king that we have. And so we can know that everything Jesus commands us to do, it's for our good. Jesus is for us. He is committed to our redemption, he's committed to our thriving and our flourishing, we can, in full hope and confidence, die to ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Jesus, knowing that where he's taking us is where we need to go, and it's where we will truly become ourselves. A lot of Jesus' commands are incredibly difficult and costly, And we don't in our flesh necessarily want to do those things. But we can know 
that Jesus is a good king. He's not just a king. He's our priest, our sympathetic high priest as well. He's for us. We can trust him. We can obey him. We can follow him even when it doesn't make sense. And the last thing that I see in this passage that's significant, and this will take us into communion, so if you have your elements, pull them out. The last thing that's significant in this passage, there are probably many other things, but the last thing I've written (laughs) that's significant in this passage is that we have a priest who lives to eternally intercede for us. Verse 23 The preacher says, now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office, but because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus always lives to intercede for us. And for a long time, I wrestled with what that means, right? When you initially read that, it makes it sound like God is still angry at us and God could still lash out at us, but thank goodness Jesus is there to jump in and be like, whoa, God, I know you want to wipe them out, but remember, I paid that bill, they're good. That's kind of how I read it for a long time, but, but no, God's wrath, God's anger, God's judgment, it's gone. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. If you're in Jesus, you have nothing but God's love and favor and blessing. So what does it mean that Jesus lives to eternally intercede? I think it just means that by his, by his very presence and the eternality of his priesthood, Jesus makes an implicit intercession for those that are his. Because Jesus lives forever and is at the right hand of the Father, I can know that my right standing with God, it'll never be revoked. I can never be unforgiven. I can never be lost to God's love. As long as Jesus is alive and there, I'm good, and he will always be alive and there so I'm always good. I love the way Paul says it in Romans 8, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we take communion today, I want us to celebrate those verses and that reality. If you've entrusted yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior He forever lives to intercede for you. You will never be lost to the love of God. You will never be unforgiven. Your right standing with God, your eternal union with him will never be revoked. You will enter into all that is promised to you because Jesus lives forever to intercede for you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's yours in Christ Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, let's celebrate that today together as we take communion. This bread symbolizes Jesus' body broken for us so that we could enter into and never be lost to the love of God. Let's take this in remembrance of him. And this juice symbolizes Jesus' blood shed for us so that we could enter into and never be lost to the love of God. Let's take this in remembrance of him. I'll just read those final verses. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, But the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son, 
who has been perfected forever. I'll give you a few moments to reflect, celebrate whatever you feel you need to do. We've got some prayers as well that might guide you in what you feel you want to do next, and then I'll invite Kirsten and Diana to lead us in our last song. Thanks again, Diana and Kirsten. I love that last song so much. Um, And hopefully many of you can sing it as your truth and your reality today. Um, Thank you again so much for joining with us. Uh, Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Next week, uh, Taffy is going to be preaching out of Hebrews chapter 8 on a greater covenant. So we look forward to hearing what Taffy has to say out of that amazing chapter. Uh, I hope that most of you will be able to join us tonight uh, at 8 o'clock. We are having a Zoom meeting, uh, relaunching our Going Deeper groups. Uh, If you signed up for a group or if you expressed that you wanted to learn more, this is for you. But I really do want to open this up to everybody. Uh, If you are just interested in hearing what this ministry is about as you try to pray and discern whether you want to be a part of this, I I would invite you to join with us tonight as we cast vision for for what Going Deeper groups are, what they could be, what they should be. Uh, We're going to hear testimonials from people in groups and how that ministry has benefited them. Uh, We're going to go through, yeah, just everything that we need to go through about this ministry. However, we will not keep you for long. Don't worry. Uh, It won't be a long meeting. We will be uh, punctual, I promise. So please join us for that if you can. The Zoom link is on our Staying Connected page in the newsletter and in the calendar. But if you still need it, you can message me and I will send it along to you. I'll pray and we'll get going. God, thank you again so much uh, for this chance to be together like this. And God, I just pray... Um, that we would walk away, if we are believers, that we would walk away knowing that because of Jesus' eternal priesthood, we can never be lost to your love. But Father, if there are some here today that don't know that, they don't know your love, they don't know your forgiveness, they don't know Jesus and what he's done for them, I pray that today would be the day where they start their journey to understanding and knowing and believing in and following Jesus. So God, whatever we need to do, uh, I pray that we would do it as a result of today and as a result of you leading us and speaking to us. Help us with these things, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for being here. God bless.